I bought a deal, a cash deal. The seller of the property says, I want to sell the house to you, but you have to evict the tenant. And we didn't do enough due diligence on the tenant. The tenant had been living there for 43 years without paying rent. 43 years. Yeah. We go and knock on the lady's door and I go, hey, I own the property now. Here's the deed. I'm just going to let you know you're going to be getting a letter from my attorney or I can give you 2,500 bucks to leave right now. She says, how can you evict me from my house? Yeah, welcome to Los Angeles. You don't even need to intro me, dude. Just say, this is Pace Morby. He has a stupid TV show on A&E that, that nobody watches. Nobody, nobody that I know watches the show. We get a million views. We get, have millions of viewers, but like I've never met any of them. They're all the people. They live, all live in Omaha, Nebraska. And sit well, they on probably all fall into your funnel and they'll start subscribing to YouTube, no, Insta, TikTok. None of them. None of them. Really? Like I was on stage yesterday speaking at Bridger's thing. And they introed me, and it sounds cool to be like Pace Morby, host of Triple Digit Flip yeah, yeah, on yeah. A&E. And everybody's like, oh, cool, credibility, TV show. But then he goes, any fans of Triple Digit Flip in here? And it was one lady in the audience out of 2,500, like, me. <laughs> but I don't think people watch TV like that. They anymore. don't. It's like everything's on their phone. Like, if you're on TikTok, right. scrolling Reels. And A&E's behind on the streaming stuff. So it's like, anyway. But yeah, just all you have to say, Pace Morby, real estate investor. Focuses on creative finance. That's it. Yeah, I mean, well, you're crushing it. You're already crushing it. Like, what do you have? Like a thousand rentals? We have uh, eighteen hundred. Eighteen hundred rentals. Yeah, eighteen hundred. Well, about three hundred of those are syndicated, so I'm only partial owner of those. But fifteen hundred in my portfolio. Cool. So, uh, tell me a little bit. We're just going to use that as the intro. Love it. So, yeah. Boom. <laughs> there deal. you go. Don't tell cut me. any of this, dude. <laughs> tell me more about uh, who you are before we can get into the real estate. Um, I'm just a guy that grew up in a family of 12 kids and um, learned how to work really hard, blue collar. Uh, my dad was a contractor. My dad went to school to become a CPA and CPAs make $60,000 a year. At the time in like the 90s and early 2000s, like 60 grand was reasonable yeah. to support a good you know household. But 12 kids, right? It's a lot. We were going through 150 eggs a week and a dozen gallons of milk every week. And so my dad had to moonlight as a contractor on the side. And so when I got to an age of like eight years old, nine years old, and I was like, hey, I want a, a, an allowance. My dad's like, you're not getting an allowance, but you can come and tape baseboards and I'll show you how to paint. So that's what I learned, right? I learned in my mind the connection between time and I get money back. Time, money. And it was just a constant exchange. And I was wired that way. I graduate high school, go uh, two years and live in Korea. And uh, I was a Mormon missionary there, basically a salesperson for Jesus, if that makes sense. And um, came back at 21. And my first thought is like, all right, time to go make money. How was I wired? I was wired to go get into construction. All right. So I got into construction and um, ultimately built a business that became uh, the way I made my first million dollars take home in a year was through having clients like Offerpad, Open Door, and Zillow were my three biggest clients. So they would go buy houses, you know, as an eye buyer, yeah. and I would do all their turns. And they paid the right price. Like I was making great margin, 20, 30% margin on all their stuff. And I was doing 50, 60 of these turns every single month, making really great money. And then the eye buyers changed their model through, you know, being intelligent. They go, We're spending too much money. Like the market's trending upward. We can buy these very quickly and put maybe $1,500 in carpet cleaning and basic stuff in and throw it right back on the market. And we can make a little bit of a 2% a margin on these houses. So they come to me and they go, we don't need contractors full-time anymore. We're going to bring like handymen in house. So they were, I was doing like $2 million a month in revenue with these companies. Mm -hmm. um, and that basically turned off overnight. Right. And wasn't a bad thing. I just started working for other flippers. Harder because now instead of me getting one order for 50 houses, I would have to go get 50 orders for one house from 50 different investors that were all fixing and flipping. And so I got into that world and was introduced to people that were fixing and flipping, buying and holding. And I had convinced myself that I was a real estate investor because I was touching all these houses. And one day I had a lady come to me and she's like, you're basically a slave to my business. You're not even a business owner. This is a hobby. You mm -hmm. don't own anything. I own you. And she did it very lovingly, but it was like a punch in the face. And um, she told me, the, probably the strongest statement she ever said was, you 
are a simple Google search away from being replaced as a contractor. You're as important to a real estate transaction as a real estate agent, a broker, a notary. All of those people can be, re be replaced. The one person that can't be replaced is the person who owns the asset. Right. And you don't own any assets. And I was like, after my 15 excuses why I hadn't gotten started in real estate, she's like, she grabs me, physically grabs me, me John, and she's like, I'm going to show you how to get your first deal. And so I got that lady, her name's Bethany Willis, shout out Bethany Willis. Uh, she helped me get my first deal and then I was off to the races and I got addicted to it. So at that point I'd already known how to do all the construction, how to manage crews, how to run a business, how to scale to a certain degree. And now you implement the purchasing of real estate to what I already knew and we just lit on fire. And um, what happened was I would run into so many leads, right? We would call, we'd either cold call sellers, text sellers, direct mail. Um, I did billboard, TV, radio, all that. You know, home investors, the We Buy Ugly House. Yeah, of course. I owned a franchise of that for two years. And so I got really good at direct mail, billboards, and all, all the We Buy Ugly Houses stuff. And I found that the majority, probably 80% of the leads that came into us were not qualified leads because they had two major problems. One, they didn't have enough equity, right? They had just bought their house with a VA loan or an yep. FHA loan like six months ago. And now they got to relocate for their new job. And they're like, I want to sell my house, but I can't because I don't have any equity in the house. And I just threw those leads away. And then I would run, number two, I'd run into sellers that go, I just want, my house might be worth 250. Zillow says it's 250, but I want 270 for my house. All right. Okay, well, welcome to real estate. That's like anybody listening to me that's like in real estate generating leads are like, yeah, I run into those all the time. And I then met my second most powerful person I ever met in my life. Her, her name is Eileen Brown. And Eileen Brown taught me creative finance. She taught me those people that don't have equity, why don't you just take over their payments on their house? I'm like, because that's not possible. She's like, no, it's possible. And I've been a I've been an escrow officer for 48 years. I've been doing that for 48 years. I know it's possible. It's legal. Here's the state forms. Here's the IRS's publication of how to do it properly. Here's Fannie Freddie's guidelines on it. Here's Dodd, and it writes, talks about it in the Dodd-Frank Act. Here's the, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, this is legal? I can just take over their payments? And she's like, yep, you can take over people's payments that have existing payments. And if the people want too much money, you can just structure a, a payment situation called seller finance. And I'm like, what? the heck and that's where I that's where I started blowing up I started realizing that there's way better ways to buy real estate where I don't have to use any credit I don't have to use any cash and I don't have to use any credentials meaning my w-2 uh, tax returns uh, it's crazy that nobody's even asked for my bank statements when I have bought all the real estate I've bought interesting so tell me a little bit more about you said you had 12 siblings 12 siblings yeah now these 12 siblings are they what do they do are they kind of like also uh, entrepreneurial? All very entrepreneurial. Um, I have eight sisters and um, three other brothers. And my oldest brother is more of a non-entrepreneur. I think he thought he was going to be an entrepreneur. Then he found the comfort of a really good nine to five. He's got the golden handcuffs. Yep. So he's like head accounting person for Vivint. I don't know if you know who. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Solar. Solar. Yeah. yeah. So he's like high up at the food chain, gets paid really, really well. And so he's like, I don't need to be an entrepreneur. I, I got a great life. Every one of my sisters is um, has the, all their own little businesses. And so they learned to, to work really hard and and um, be entrepreneurs by watching my my mom and my dad. Cool. Uh, yeah. So your mom and dad, they stayed together the whole way? Yep. Same same mom and dad. Same. Never got a divorce. Still together to this day. I see them once a week. That's awesome. See, one of the great things about your social media is that it seems like you've built an incredible community. And the, usually people that uh, build a great community either – they've kind of been raised around that type of environment or they understand the importance of it. Yeah, I think it came from uh, when I was little, my mom and dad would wake us up at five o'clock in the morning and we would read the Bible every morning together. Yeah, It'd be like verse by verse by verse and we'd go around the room kind of like campfire style and we'd read the verses and then my mom would stop and go, all right, who wants to share what they learned? Who wants to share how you can apply this to your life today? And that was the, the communal aspect of my family. So when I got into business, it was missing. In fact, like if we end up wanting to talk about my community, I, we could talk about that. But I created my community out of sheer need for what I had in my family. Right. It was la it was lacking in the industry. Um, 
dude, I could, I could, this is John Williams. Like, do you know who I'm talking to right now? This is the John Williams. So I, I could talk to you for two hours about that topic it, itself, but um, the community aspect was missing in the real estate industry. So like when I first started generating leads, I same thing with like, you know, I, I look up to you, you're one of my heroes in the YouTube world and the, in the real estate U YouTube influence space. One of the smartest guys I, I know um, on the internet regarding real estate. And there's a collaborative feeling where I can watch you and I'm like, I admire you. And then I get to meet you. And it's like, we become friends really, really quickly. In real estate, without the influence aspect, just like real estate investor to real estate investor, it's very cutthroat. Right. And they'll go around your back. So this is, there was a, something that happened to me that I was like, I'm going to create a community that combats that. And here's what happened to me. I get a lead. Um, it's a condo. Phoenix, Arizona, seller is in Colorado. Okay. It's his second home. His wife is passing away. Um, she's ill. I need to sell the property. I'm also a real estate investor, he says. I know the price you need to buy this at, which you got to love a seller that's like that. Yeah. Um, and he says, but one thing is I, want, I need to sell it by this Friday. I need to sign the paperwork. We need to get this thing done. I want to make sure that we're wrapped up so I can go focus on my wife. Right. I got a timeline. Um, but here's the thing. You have to physically come and see me and sign the documents face to face. And I'm sitting here going, okay, his name's John, by the way. John, I'm like, no problem. I'll send you a mobile notary. He's yeah. like, no, no, no. I'm not asking you to sign to me with me in person because I'm not good with technology and I can't do a DocuSign. I'm telling you that if you're a man and I'm a man, we're shaking hands, looking at each other yep. in, in the eyeballs. He's an old school guy. Yeah. And we're going to do this deal face to face. I'm like, crap. I don't live in, I'm not in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is silly. I, I'm going to be really efficient with this. So what I, here's what I did. I go on the biggest web forum for real estate investors. In bigger pockets? It was bigger pockets. Yeah. And I, ironically, I just became a Wall Street Journal bestseller with Bigger Pockets as my publisher yesterday. Awesome, congrats. Which is cool. But at the time, this is years and years ago, um, there was a non-collaborative feeling in their forums. Very like hostile. If you were a wholesaler, the realtors would attack you and it just was non-collaborative. So I go in the forums because this is the only place I could go to get help. And I said, hey, I've got this situation. I need somebody to be my JV partner on this deal um, and go meet with the seller and say, you're my partner. Right. First, all I got was ridicule and people attacking me in the comments and like, oh, you stupid wholesaler. All you're going to do is wholesale the property and da, 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 da. I'm like, well, who cares what I'm going to do with the property? The guy will sell it to me at this price. Whether I put it in my portfolio, I flip it or I wholesale it. What do you yeah. care? Nobody wanted to help me. So now it's Wednesday before Friday. The guy, John, says he's going to sell it on Friday. And um, I get somebody messages me from the forums and they say, hey, I can help you. Um... I'll go to on the appointment for you. I go, no problem. We work out a 50-50 split. And I get a call from the seller on Thursday. And he says, hey, your partner stopped by the house. And he brought with him a screenshot of your post on Bigger Pockets. Hmm. And he said that all you are is a dirty wholesaler and that he'd like me to sell the house to him directly. Wow. Bro. Yeah. Think about the freaking hostility that you have to go. I'm going to screenshot this, go to my printer, print this thing out and wait for it to print off my my printer, full on planning to just go around and stab me in the back. So I am like embarrassed. I'm caught off guard on this phone call. I'm like, oh, he goes, don't worry. I'm a man of my word. I told you I was going to sell the house to you at this price. This guy already showed me his true colors. I'm not going to sell the house to him unless you don't come and meet me face to face. So, John, it's like 5 o'clock Thursday. He wants me to be there by fr Friday, 5 o'clock. I look at flights. This guy's not just in Denver. He's like, you got to fly to Denver, rent a car, drive three hours up into the north northeast corner of, of Colorado. Yep. I'm like, I'm not going to make it. The flights aren't until like, you know, 9 o'clock the next morning. I'm not going to be able to make it. So... I'm laying in bed. It's like one o'clock in the morning and I'm like, screw it. And I just jump in my Prius 
and I drive 17 hours to get all the way up to this guy's house at like 4.30 in the afternoon, 30 minutes before he's like, I'm going to sell this to somebody else. I meet him face to face. We get the deal done. He shakes my hand and he looks me right in the eye and he says, thank you. And he says, don't worry. Get used to people stabbing you in the back. I'm old. I know how this is. You're never going to get around it. And dude, that hit me hard. Yeah. So this is what I did. On the drive home, 16 hours back, I sat there and voice memoed a plan to myself of I'm going to create a community of people that no matter where I am in the country, I can get a deal, I can get private money, I can get somebody to go boots on the ground, knock a door, get a contractor. What is it that I need? I need a transactional a transaction coordinator. I need a title company. I need a closing attorney. How can I build something where no matter where I am in the country, I can get a deal right now? You name a city you want to buy in, I can get you a deal there in less than 15 minutes. Okay, this is how cool it is. I'm in Grant Cardone's office two days ago. I tell him what subject to and seller finance is. He tells me, there's no way this is real. Is this real? He's like, I got 115 million in cash. How do we just go and buy all these deals? I go, you, I go, let's go buy one. He's like, cool. Next 30 days, I go, how about the next five minutes? He goes, where? I go, where do you want one? He says, Texas. So within three minutes, three minutes, John, I have a property under contract that's our, somebody else has already contracted it, one of my students. Mm -hmm. And I go, hey, I'll buy that deal from you. I'll give you a $10,000 finder's fee and Grant Cardone and I will buy it together. And in three minutes, we record the whole thing. Eric was with me. And Grant is like, are you freaking kidding me? These people are just letting you take over their mortgage payments. I go, Grant, the, that's not the cool part. The cool part is the fact that I can, you name a city and I've got somebody there a title company, a student, a deal finder, a wholesaler, a fix and flipper that I have vetted and I trust in this really close, tight knit community. So it didn't start there. How did it? How did that community begin? Oh, like where where did you first plant that seed, and how did it kind of move? Wow, what a great question. So, um, an office very similar to this I used to have. This is probably seven years ago. I um, I got home, and um, I was driving back from from Colorado. And I, the first plan of attack was I'm going to be the person that I needed people to be for me when I started, which was I'm monkey see monkey do really, really stupid. Like I had to watch you on YouTube for months and months to like dissect what you were doing to be able to have the gall and the courage to go and do it myself. Like I have to watch and then do right. So I go, I'll do the same thing for other people. I'm going to go on Instagram stories. It was like right when Instagram stories popped off. And I'm going to go on there and go, who wants to meet me at Circle K Saturday morning? Jump in my Prius. I'll take you on appointments. I'll take you to projects. I'll let you meet my lenders. I will, I will show you everything. Like the stuff that even there's these gurus out there charging like 50 grand for. I'll show you the stuff that those guys don't even have. And even if they do have it, they wouldn't show it to you. Right. And I'll do it for free. And uh, first Saturday morning, nobody shows up because nobody knew who the hell I was. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that didn't stop me. So the next Saturday I did it again, three people showed up, but now the difference is I have people in my car. So now I can document and show people on Instagram stories. Like, so Hey, how did those three people at that point, when you did that, how many followers did you have on OG? Probably 3000. Got it. And so the first 3000 followers, what was that like? Were you just basically posting, uh, your journey of trying to find uh -huh. all sellers? my, all my failures. I, I called it the good, the bad, the ugly strategy. I'll show you the good, but I'm going to show you the bad, and I'm going to really emphasize the ugly. I'm going to show you, hey, I almost lost money on this deal. Hey, this person stabbed me in the back, but this is how I'm overcoming it. Hey, this is the paperwork I used. Then I stood in front of a judge, and the judge told me that paperwork was not a good set of – okay, well, I learned. Yeah. right? I downloaded a free contract off somebody's website. I, I got into a, a tiff with the seller. The seller says that contract's invalid because of X, Y, and Z. I'm like, bull crap. I'm going to fight you. Go to fight them. The judge says, actually, the seller's right. Your contract you use a piece of crap. So I would document all of those things. And now it looks like everything's perfect. Right. And I get criticism. Sometimes people go, oh, man, you make it look so easy. I'm like, bro, I, I can't talk about what I was doing eight years ago anymore. If you want to go see it, go sc scroll through my Instagram. It's still there. Yeah. It's not my fault you don't want to go look at that. But it was the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the reality is I feel like an audience needs that more than they need the guy who owns a thousand units. Right. They don't need the guy that owns a thousand. Well, units. I think people also are, they're much more aware that a lot of it is uh, like bullshit. Like they, yeah. they basically like paint this picture that everything is so easy. Everything is so simple. Right. And then it's like, okay, this guy has a Lambo. He's mansion on the beach. And yeah. 
Uh, they just got. I don't that have easily. either one of those, by the way, Dominic. And then it's like when you actually highlight the true journey of like what's actually yeah. going down and all the all the problems that have occurred to actually get to. Bro, a, it's why I still drive a Prius. Yeah. People are like, they they resonate with that, and they're like, they DM me all the time. They go, I, I love that you still drive a Prius. I'm like, it remember it reminds me of how important that journey was for me because what here's what happens. One of the first people that came in my car was a girl named Debbie Lou. Debbie Lou, still to this day, seven, eight years later, still is my private money lender. And she saw the she saw me go on appointments with sellers, right? I'd get a call from a seller off a billboard or off a piece of direct mail, and I would set those appointments on Saturdays, and I would take people with me, and they just sit, I go, rule number one, don't say anything, just watch me, okay? I'll tell these people that you're here to learn from me, but just don't, because the first, the first week I took people out, I had people that were like, oh, I'm in the, an appointment, and they, they're they watching the seller and myself converse about their house. And the sellers, you know, I'm, I'm unearthing their pain in order to provide a solution to that pain. And you'd get somebody inexperienced that's watching that, one of these three people, and they would then interject into my conversation. And I'm looking over at them like, what are you doing? Right. I'm in a process here. You are screwing up my process, right? You don't, don't rush the, 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 Dough has to rise. Mm -hmm. Don't mess with the dough. And so I would make ground rules and show, like, take people out. But one of the people that I took out on the first appointment, Debbie Lou, she watched me work and she's just like, I'm never going to be you. How can I just invest in your projects? And I was like, holy crap. You show people how to do this, you will attract like 15 different types of people. I, this was one, it became one of the best. Um, recruiting mechanisms for like acquisition people on my team. Um, I, I never, from doing my ride-alongs when I was doing ride-alongs for all those years, I never attracted very, very high level people. It, I, I attract very high level people when I step on stage and in, in front of like, you know, a seminar. But here's what happened. So the first day I take Debbie Lou and a couple of other, pe other people out. Debbie Lou, I, she still lends money to me here and there. And, um, I now had three people in my car that I could document and go, hey, look at these three people. Hey, here's this appointment. They saw that they the audience that's watching me on Instagram, which was only 3,000 at the time, probably 500 of them were in Arizona. The other 2,500 were random people across the country. Um, they were like, oh, wow, he's actually doing what he said he was going to do. Right. I thought he was full of crap. So now I do this again the next Saturday. And I say, uh, Circle K parking lot, 6 a.m. Saturday morning. Who wants to go go with me? I'm just a workhorse. I, I'm like, I'm out at six. I go home at six, right? Type of type of guy. And um, how many people showed up? Do you think the third week I did this? Twelve. Sixty three people. Circle K called the police. They're like, what the freak is going on here? Is there, this is a gang fight. This is a turf war going on here, you know? And I, so what I had to do, I had an office. It was similar to this vibe. It was like in a, you know, like a commercial space. And we had basically like three versions of what you have here. And I go, oh, dude, I got this really big whiteboard. Why don't you guys just all come over to my office and I'll just whiteboard for you guys all day long and I'll order a taco truck. So I ordered a taco truck. I spent 650 bucks and I remember spending the 650 bucks. And I was like, dude, that's like two months of cash flow on one of my rentals. I'm just going to give this away to these people. But then the abundance of what I received in return it was like people going, you just changed my life. I've been watching YouTube. I've been to seminars. I paid a guy 25 grand and he didn't teach me all this stuff. And I'm like giving addresses and I'm giving like, here's my number. Oh, hey, here's the settlement statement on this thing. See how the settlement statement reads? Here's the this and here's how the money transpires. Right. And I didn't, I forgot, John, how it felt to do my first deal up until I watched somebody else hearing some of this stuff for the first time in an office similar to this. So the people that were there gaining that experience, what was it like for them to, I guess, go from where they were to understanding how to do the first deal? What was the first deal? Like, how would you describe the ideal first type of transaction for someone that wants to get into real estate? I would say the first I, the ideal first transaction is not a multifamily deal. A lot of people get shiny object syndrome and they're like, I want to go multifamily. If you're going to do a fourplex, do it. Yeah. Most like non real estate guys would consider a duplex multifamily. Like people that are brand new to real estate go, oh, it's two houses that are two doors. That's multifamily. So yeah. it's not technically, but I would tell them four units or less on your first deal. 
And you have to make a determination. Do you want to go direct to seller, which requires skill sets and sales and spending money on leads? Or do you want to go to somebody who already has a house under contract, like a wholesaler, a real estate agent, right? And I would say, go do your, a, a single family deal. You can, there's only three ways to make money in real estate, only three. And now real estate agents are going to argue with this because they think that they're in real estate. They're not. They're a service provider to me who is in real estate, right? right? You can wholesale a deal, right? Find a deal, get it under contract, sell the contract to me, make a finder's fee. That's wholesale. Two, you can fix and flip or develop, right? Meaning I buy something, I do something to it. Add value, exit. Yeah, add value and exit, fix and flip. Now, there's obviously much larger ver scales of that, of like buy a piece of land, build an apartment, sell it. Yeah. Still fix and flip development. And then the third way to make money is buy and hold. And there's a hundred different categories underneath buy and hold, like Airbnb or Section 8 or whatever my exit strategy is in that umbrella. But who are you? Some people, I have a, I have a student, her name is Yatang, makes like 300 grand a year in her programming job, works 10 hours a week. Should she go out and try and wholesale a deal? No. She makes good money. Yeah, she's making 25, 20, 30 grand a month. She doesn't like. need another job. What she needs is she needs to go and buy a deal, put it in her portfolio and start growing her portfolio. So I would tell people that would come into these whiteboard sessions in my office, like you have to know yourself. And I would dissect them individually. And I ended up coming up with 21 avatars after seeing thousands of people coming through my office over a couple of years, I would see kind of mirror images of people's personalities. And I go, oh, you are, you should just be a transaction coordinator. You should be helping other people do their paperwork and um, getting paid $100,000 a year in the process. But then you also get the first look at all the deals when people bring them to you. Right. And these people go, oh, you're right. I don't want to talk to sellers. I don't want to negotiate. I don't want to sit in people's appointments. I don't want to have to build an acquisition team. That's not for everybody. But I would say you got to, Know Your Avatar. I have a great YouTube video. It's a four-hour YouTube video called Know Your Avatar, and it dissects each one of those 21 avatars. Know Your Avatar, get your first single-family deal, and you can get a deal easily within two to three weeks. That's the ideal start. So what do you think is the easiest way to find a deal? Easiest way to find a deal is to find somebody who already has a deal under contract. Like if I text, if I send out a text to all the people that find deals for me. Well, let's say, for example, uh, Dominic. Maybe Dominic. Dominic, has you want a deal? Okay, Dominic, you, here, let's break him down, okay? So, Dominic, you're a young guy, right? You're like, I want to make an extra trip. What's more important to you this month? Is it to get a deal in your portfolio to have passive income, like three, $400 a month of passive income? Or is it I'd rather have a chunk of ten to maybe $20,000 on my first deal that I don't own a house, but I made twenty grand in a, as a chunk? For me right now, I'd probably want to get passive income. Oh, really? I, was, I would not have guessed that. I would have guessed you'd be like, give me the 20 grand so I can buy a fourth camera, right? Um, okay, so you want to buy and hold deal. Cool. So what I would do is I would go to, I have a Facebook group. It's a free Facebook group called Creative Finance with Pace Morby. And I created this Facebook group. This was like phase three of building my community. Phase one was just personal connection with everybody. Right. And it got to a point where too many people were trying to come to my office that I couldn't fit people in my office anymore. It was like, imagine this whole entire parking lot full of people. Right. It was, it got out of control. This is four years before I built a YouTube channel. I should have just built a YouTube channel. I didn't. I made a Facebook group so that people could put their questions in there. And then I would go in there in the mornings and I'd answer all their questions. Well, that Facebook group now has 90,000 members in it. Okay. And you can't scroll more than 10 seconds without finding a deal right now. Like if we go in there right now, you want a deal in Florida, I could find you a deal in Florida within three minutes of scrolling. And when I say a deal, here's what it is. It's Tim Smith makes a post in my Facebook group. He says, South Florida, subject to deal. I have it under contract. Who wants to buy this deal from me? So it's sellers letting you take over the payment so you don't have to qualify. You don't need to get a loan. Seller says, just take over the house. It has a 3% interest, let's say 3 4% interest. And Tim wants a $10,000 finder's fee. Okay. And you're like, all right, well, I didn't have to find the deal, negotiate the deal, work out the paperwork. I didn't have to mess with any of that stuff. You deserve the 10 grand that you are asking for this finder's fee, right? Well, crap, where does that 10 grand come from? No, no, no. 
You gotta you gotta come up, you gotta come up with 10 grand to pay Tim Smith. Bro, we're not getting a loan. Okay. Let me tell you what let me tell you what I do. I don't think you know what I do. Okay. Do you have a do you have a payment on your cell phone? Yeah. You still have a payment on your cell phone, right? Okay, cool. And who's the payment with? Uh, with T Mobile. Perfect. So Dominic, let's say I go to you. I don't have a I don't have a payment on this phone. Okay. This is a year old phone. How how much do you think this phone is worth today? Like if I went and put it on Craigslist right now, maybe a thousand bucks. Okay, so I put this on Craigslist for a thousand bucks. I I probably am gonna am I gonna sell it for a thousand or is somebody gonna lowball me for like eight seventy? Cool. So if somebody was gonna lowball me eight seventy. I could put this phone on Craigslist today, and say thirteen hundred dollars, and I could actually sell it for thirteen hundred dollars. You know how I would sell it for thirteen hundred bucks? I'd say, pay me 50 bucks a month and I'll let you take my, my phone. That's called seller. I'm the seller. Financing. I'm financing my buyer. So does my buyer need to go get a loan to buy the phone? Does he need a credit check? Does he even need any money up front? Or does he just start making me $50 payments? That's called seller finance. That's what I do with houses and apartment buildings and RV parks. I just go to the seller directly and I go, you're trying to get $1,000 for your iPhone? How about I pay you a thousand dollars? Everybody else wants to lowball you eight seventy. I'll pay you a thousand bucks as long as you let me pay fifty bucks a month. Okay, that's called seller finance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so no loan. That's crazy. No credit check. Nobody's asking what how much money I have in the bank. Nobody gives a crap. Okay. Subject two is another strategy that I use, which is where my logo comes from, and that's why I asked about your phone. You have a payment on your phone of T-Mobile, so let's say I want to buy your phone but I don't wanna, I can't come up with the money today. You know what I can do? I can just take over your payments with T-Mobile. No credit check. You already, you already did the credit check. You already obtained the loan. Why would I go get a new loan just to pay off your loan with T-Mobile? The only people that make money is the new lender and your lender. What if I just go, hey, Dominic, I'll give you a hundred bucks and I'll take over your existing payments on the phone. Could I do that technically? Okay, that's what I do with houses. I go to people that have these houses and I go, hey, you have a payment on this house and it's a 3% interest rate. How about I just start making the payments on that house and you give me the deed, which is the ownership, and you walk away with 2,000 bucks, 3,000 bucks, whatever. That's what I do. That's how I buy real estate really, really fast with no credit checks, no banks are involved, nobody's asking about my tax returns. I can be an illegal resident of the United States and buy real estate this way legally. It's bonkers. It's bonkers. Okay? So when I say somebody in my Facebook group, Tim Smith, has a post that says, deal for sale, that means he's got a seller that's letting you, Dominic, just take over the payments with no credit check, no loan, no nothing. Okay? Crazy. Still to this day, after doing thousands of deals and owning a title company, we've done, our title companies has done tens of thousands of transactions. I still, to this day, I'm like, this is crazy that how easy this is. So Dominic, Tim Smith in the Facebook group goes, I got a deal, but I want a $10,000 finder's fee and the seller wants five grand to walk away from their house. And you're going to have $5,000 in closing costs. So to buy this property, you need 20 grand. Where's that 20 grand coming from? You don't have the answer, so I'll tell you. If I found a good deal, John, and it was a 3% deal where I could just take over somebody's payments, would you bring 20 grand to the table if I brought the deal to the table? Yeah, if the deal made sense, yeah. So you bring a, either A, you bring a partner, we call them a PMP, a private money partner, or B, a private money lender, like an uncle, an aunt, or somebody you go to and go, I've got a deal, I can take over payments at 3% right now, and I need 20 grand to do it. You go to your aunt and your aunt can give you the 20 grand. And what's crazy about that, you're young, you've never bought a house, right? If I go to a bank right now, Bank of America, let's say Quicken Loans, whoever the heck it is that's going to give me a loan, and I tell them that my grandma or my aunt is going to give me the 20 grand that's needed to close on the deal, they'll say, that you can't bring 20 grand from your family member. That needs to be your money and it needs to be seasoned in your bank account. Bro, I have none of those rules in what I do. None of those rules exist. So I can buy and sell real estate without any of the rules associated with any of the traditional stuff. So um, if you want a deal, you go in my Facebook group and you scroll through and you find Tim Smith or one of the thousands of deals that are going on in there and you go, I'll take that deal. They assign it to you, meaning they go, hey, I have it under contract. Let's you and I 
come up with a new contract saying that you now have the rights to my original contract. You just got to pay me 10 grand the day we close escrow. Okay. That money comes from your private money lender or from John Williams that would partner with you. That's how you go get your first deal. You could, get, you could own a piece of real estate by the end of this, by the end of next week with 3% interest, no credit check, no credentials and bring in a partner that brought the money to the table. So let's say, for example, Dominic, he has a goal. That first goal is obviously a little passive income, yeah. right? But he he really wants to make a hundred grand, and he wants to figure out how he can get liquid, mm. right? He wants to have liquid cash. You can go out there and buy a deal, like cool. his own, like maybe a house for his mom or whatever he wanted to do. Easy, the traditional way, right? Easy. Okay. So would he do something like wholesale? Either wholesale, or would he potentially do like a value add property to where he could basically do sub two and then find a way in which he could add value, maybe adding an ADU or fixing it up. Would he be able to then refinance and pull that yeah. hundred out? Yeah, yeah. You could do that. Here's the challenge with that, as you know, um, is that if I'm Dominic, Dominic, what do you know about managing contractors? Anything? Very little. Oh, I can tell you right now the may the number one biggest issue in real estate when you're doing value add is managing the city and the permits. Mm -hmm the construction materials, and nine, that's 10% of it. 90% of it is the contractor. Because even a good, honest contractor is going to take advantage of you, whether he knows he's doing it or he's, he doesn't know he's doing it, it's going to happen and you have to be a babysitter. And so, Dominic, no offense to you, but you're a young dude. Have you, do you know much about babysitting contractors? You would assume contractors know more about construction than you do. And you would assume they know more about running their business than you do. The truth is contractors don't know how to run business. They know how to build houses. And so you have to step in in a value add situation. And what you're really doing as a fix and flipper or building an ADU is you're playing project manager because the contractor will 100% take advantage of you. Yep. If you are not squawking and cracking the whip on them all the time, another customer of theirs is simultaneously and they will get the, the grease because they are the squeaky wheel and then your project gets no attention. And you've heard these stories a thousand times. My contractor screwed me. No, they didn't intentionally screw you. You're just a piss poor manager and you don't know construction. So I would say for somebody young, I would say stay away from value add. Um, somebody that doesn't have that experience, unless a, a John Williams or Pace, okay? If you go, Dominic, you go to Pace and you go, hey, I wanna do a couple of flips. Would you partner with me? Now I bring the experience of managing the contractor to the table and then you can learn by osmosis and by proximity. You do five or six of those with me, now you're ready to go do one on your own. So let's say Dominic, his first deal, how yeah. much would, if he were to do, you see the guy's name, uh, Tom, hypothetically, yeah, yeah. and it was a $350,000 uh, mortgage, maybe the property is worth $340,000, $350,000, okay. right? So maybe the, the seller's negative equity is 7 or 8% when yeah. you figure in cost of sale, mm -hmm. right? And so with that, if he has a 3% mortgage, maybe it's, I don't know, in Florida with high insurance, maybe 15, maybe 1600 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. um, so what would that play be? Would it be take it, rent it out, maybe rent it for two grand a month, mm -hmm. make that, call it 5,800 bucks, six grand a year if it's fully rented, and then basically sit on that cash flow? Yep. So what about like in the event of, uh, let's say eviction, vacancies, repairs, stuff like that? How does that kind of play? So I, I take 20% uh, of all my rent. So let's say that I rent something for 2000 bucks. I put $400 into what I call a war chest account. And yeah. that, uh, that, so it's like, I'm just planning on going to war. Yeah. Evictions, broken windows, blah, blah, blah. Um, here's the thing that's not sexy about buy and hold as a traditional rental. I can't really raise my rents every six months or every year. I mean, sometimes you get these crazy, crazy COVID timelines where yeah, like yeah. everybody raises their rents like crazy. But normally I can raise my rents in a decent market every 36 months, probably 10 to 12%, okay? Somewhere around there, depending on the market. So the thing that's not sexy about single family is that if you're doing a traditional regular rental, you're like, man, my $300 a month in cash flow after vacancy and repair allocation is not even enough to pay my freaking cell phone bill. Right. Yes, but what you're not taking into consideration is the appreciation you're getting. Mm -hmm. You're getting tax be benefits as well. I get I don't pay taxes anymore. Haven't for a long time. So how does how does that work? So if the seller's holding the actual paper, the mortgage. The you're seller you're holding the deed. I have the deed. So, so I have what's he called He has the actual liability, right? He has the liability, yeah. Seller has a liability on his credit. However, I have ownership in what's called fee title, which means now I'm the one that gets all the tax benefits of the property. 
So what about like you? So you can write off the interest of the loan. You can yep, write off because I'm the one paying it. Yeah. So the at, at close of escrow, the seller signs documents um, assigning his rights to the mortgage um, interest write offs. Got it. Yeah, and we so, get all that. Yeah. So when you're the impound when, accounts, correct. Yeah. So when when you take that, then the seller obviously. Do you ever have a situation where the sellers also like they they start trying to write it off as well, and you guys are doing like double write offs, even though yeah. that's not a part of the deal? Yeah, that's happened a, a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. But what do I care? It doesn't really phase you. It doesn't, doesn't phase me at all. Like you, a, sell, a seller can put whatever on the taxes; doesn't affect me. Yeah. Yeah, we've had weird, all sorts of weird stuff. Yeah. And so, like with that type of example, what is like the actual is the long term play basically to accumulate these like almost like uh, little hotels and monopoly, and yep. then have the tenants pay it off. And then ultimately, yep. you refi it when value goes up, or you yep you can refi it? you can refi. So like right before, I'd say 2009, 2020, um, I'm sorry, two thousand and twenty one, we did a big like forty five or forty six of our houses with they had good interest rates, but we saw like hey interest rates are going to go up. We've got like twelve million dollars in equity in these houses. Yeah. Let's refinance a bunch, suck out the equity, redeploy the capital, pay off any private money lenders. Let's, you know, yeah, yeah. and roll forward and roll forward, whatever. Um, and not roll forward because I'm not doing a sale, but you just pull the money out tax free. Yeah. Did you know that that you could do that, Dominic? Check this out. This is what he's talking about. Let's say I buy a house for two hundred grand, meaning I took over somebody else's payments that has a two hundred thousand dollar loan at three percent interest. 10 years later, that house is now worth, let's say, 350 And my tenants have paid that property down to like, let's say, 150 okay? That means I got $200,000 of equity in that deal, right? So I could do a refinance. Let's say I decide I'm going to pull a hundred grand out of that. Do you know that $100,000 is non-taxable? I can get a, a chunk of a hundred grand in my pocket and it's non-taxable. That's what Robert Kiyosaki primarily does. That's where mm -hmm. he gets his big chunks of money. I'm good friends with uh, his uh, manager, uh, uh, Ken McElroy. Yeah, he's a bright guy. Bro. Extremely bright guy. Bro. Yeah. He, like, this dude has a full-time person in their, in their office called the uh, um, director of philanthropy. Her full-time job is to give all their money away. Like that's another level. Yeah, you know, I'm not there yet. That that I when I saw that a couple of weeks ago, I was hanging out in their office. I was like, wow, there's levels I haven't even seen before. But you can do that. So that's what John's saying. He's saying, all right. So is the play you accumulate real estate, you let them go, go up in value, and then you let your tenants pay them down, creates this massive delta between what is what is owed and what they're worth, and then every five to twelve years, you suck out big chunks of cash. And the answer is yes. That is, that is a big play. Or you can do what I think I'll probably end up doing, which what I'll do is I'll probably start selling off some of my single family in about 10 years, and I'll roll all of those forward into much larger projects. Right. Um, and you never really, you're not really ever going to just go, I'm, I'm retired, I'm done. Because like you said, this is a game of Monopoly. Mm -hmm. Why would you stop playing the game? What, what, if you quit and you retire, what the crap are you going to do with your days all day right. long? And what are your kids going to learn from that? Right? Like I want my kids lear learning how to work hard. Like you want your kids to learn how to work, work hard. Mm -hmm. So, um, when you first start the, the first goal is like, I want cash flow, Right. And you, it's like, what his, here's how I thought about it when I first started, I go, if I can get every house to cash flow about an average of $400 a month, net, net, it just takes every bill I have and it checks them off. Right. It's like, okay, health insurance. That's my health insurance for my family is 1200 bucks at the time. That means I got to get three houses to never have to worry about health insurance ever again. Okay. My groceries are about a thousand dollars a month. Okay. That means I got to get two and a half houses to never have to worry about groceries ever yep. again. And you think small until you start compounding and you have new perspectives and you have new relationships, new relationships, new resources, new experiences that expose you to a new way of thinking. You go, holy crap, I was thinking way too small. I should have been buying bigger deals and doing bigger things. And But in the very beginning, it's all about how can I just chisel away at my expenses so that I'm not beholden to whatever daily obligations I have with maybe a nine to five job. So like for that example, a $400 cash flow, right? Yeah. Are you self-managing or do you- are Yeah, you in, the, like in the beginning when I had my first 10 properties, I self-managed. Yeah. And then I'm like, wait, for every minute I'm managing is a minute I'm not finding a deal. And at the time, um, there was a, the highest and best use of my time was sitting on somebody's couch 
talking to them about their problem yep. and then finding a solution to bring to the table for their problem. Definitely. And so I go, I'm wait, I'm, you know, these are things you learn as a business owner. Same thing with you. Like, John, was there a point where you didn't have an a, a, a audio engineer? Definitely. And then you realize, one, it's way more fun with Dominic. He's a character in the show. Okay. Why don't we put a camera on you, dude? People need to know what you look like. Dang, bro. We got to get you another camera. <laughs> okay. And that, so you, you then go, wait, it's way more fun having people on the team. And then two, I can now go and serve my highest and best use of my time. I would say the biggest issue I had in the very beginning regarding that is that nobody told me, hey, like, hey, John Williams, if, if, if you need to go delegate and get four hours a day off your plate. The problem I had with that thought process was, well, what the crap do I fill the other four hours with? And so subconsciously, if I didn't know where I should have allocated my time appropriately, I wouldn't delegate the four hours in the first place because it's like, well, now I'm just waste. Like, what am I going to do with those four hours? Right. So I had to learn how to give myself permission to go to a higher and best use, a higher and best use, a higher and best use of my time. And in the process, continually de delegate and hire, delegate and hire, delegate and hire. My, I've been doing this for, uh, you know, eight years, nine years. I just made the best hire of my life a year and a half ago. And that person has exponentially changed my life. If I, and you, he, Eric could already tell you, what's the name? What's her name? Oh, he's listening to it. He's, he's listening to something else. We, are you over there listening to Post Malone? Nothing. So um, in the very beginning, it's like you get to 12 rentals and you go, this is a lot. Yeah. Um, amidst trying to have kids and building business and doing all that stuff. So I hired a company called OnQ Property Management to start taking the management off, and they charged me 8% of my gross. And um, so my cash flow went down a little bit, but I was okay with that because now I've got tenants still paying the bills. I don't yep. have to worry about it. And then in my mind, there was a, a, re, a great reset. And the reset was, I no longer have any properties to worry about. You can scale. Let's go get 12 more. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think is like the perfect deal for... Uh, for a Dominic or for anyone that's getting into, let's say, for example, they're between, I don't know, 20 and 30. They're renting right now. Yeah. Uh, we were seeing a lot, at least the I am in the headlines, people are kind of going through an affordability problem with yeah. inflation. Oh. <laughs> so like people that want to go from, they're renting an apartment right now that they yeah. can barely afford. Yeah. They have a goal of being a homeowner, but the idea of being able to save up money, it seems nearly impossible yeah. and getting that credit check and doing the traditional route. So it would be the perfect deal for that person to get to a place of, uh, break even on housing costs so they can start thinking about the future. Okay. So if you're aggressive like me, I'm not going to go house hacking. Okay. Which means, you know, Dominic, you make enough money, you could probably go get an FHA loan, I bet. Okay. You could go get an FHA loan, get a duplex, a triplex or a fourplex, probably a smart way to go, and then rent out three, rent out three, live in one type of thing. Yeah. That's like a grounder. In, the, in baseball terms, that's like so easy. You could go do that tomorrow. Like you, we could go pull you a list of fourplexes right now. Get Dominic and are you renting right now, dog? Um, uh, yeah. We need to stop you doing that. Don't listen to Grant Cardone. Renting, renting is bad. Okay, Grant is full of crap with that. Renting is good temporarily, but you need to own. Um, so you could do a fourplex house hack. That's like grounder type of thing. First base hit. What I would do is I would say, how do I go find a house right now? I would buy it subject to or seller finance without having to go qualify. And I would probably rent out the rooms and I would live in one of the rooms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Affordability. So for a dumb, if, uh, and for a lot of people that don't understand what seller finance is, they essentially act as the bank and they finance it. Yeah. The, the phone, yeah, the phone like analogy, the phone right? Example, yep. So, um, and you can go get those deals in my Facebook group. It's free Facebook group. Their, their deals are in there. Um, bro, I almost want to just do a deal with you. Like, and just show you how to do it and then get you to live in one of the three bedrooms, rent out the other two. Are you opposed to having roommates? Okay. So let's say the payment on that house is like 1800 bucks. P-I-T-I, everything, yeah. right? Everything included. Principal, Principal insurance, tax insurance. Yeah, the total payment's 1800 bucks. You go, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rent out the other two rooms for $900 each, right? That's pretty great deal for the other two people because the average rent rate in the United States right now is like $1,800. So they get to live in a house rather than an apartment, right? Big kitchen, nice living room, all that kind of stuff. They're making the entire payment for you and you're, you're, you now are no payment. Now, the money you were paying on your rent, what do you pay for rent right now? Uh, right now, it's, I'm actually paying uh, 
Okay, twelve hundred. Now you can save your twelve hundred dollars that you would have allocated towards your rent towards another down payment on a second house. And that first like snowball effect of it like barely coming down the hill takes the most amount of time, but then it starts compounding and compounding and compounding and it gets scary big really, really fast. So that's probably a perfect deal for somebody that's brand new. So it, does this model work mainly like if, if the market starts going down, for example? Yeah. Um, like historically, it'll only go down for 18 months, 24 months, and it starts to soften yeah. and then slowly rise again. Mm -hmm. um, in the event of like, I guess, like inflationary pressures or like more defaults, what is the play in that like situation? Okay, so people, this is an interesting thing. Like all my buddies in 2008 that, were, went, that went through the crash, they what happened is they let a lot of their properties go. Yeah. And now when I talk to them, you know, they're older guys, 60, 50, et cetera, that were just 10 years ahead of me. Yeah. And I'm like, what do you think you did wrong in 2008, 2009, when you let 40, 50, 60 houses go in your portfolio? And they go, I sold because I was worried about my equity position. Right. Which is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It is 100% irrelevant. It's the same thing with stocks. It's like, just because Apple stock went down 20% yesterday doesn't mean that you should sell. Yeah. Like I have stocks for my two sons. Yeah. I don't care if they go up, down, and center, or sideways. Like in 20 years, we'll see what it is. Right. So it's the same thing with real estate. The great thing about real estate versus stocks is that it's guaranteed historically to go up. And then also the, the way that you have your payments structured is it's also guaranteed to go down to a lower debt point. Right. So you are guaranteed to make money. So even, even if the market's trending downward, what do I care what the equity? I tell people all the time, equity comes, equity goes, but the cash will always flow. Well, no. So like in the event of, let's say, uh, higher defaults, like people not paying rent. So like, do you structure oh, hey. your leases differently? Do you like, well, how would you kind of play that out if you're looking at, let's say, for example. The main, um, the main, main strategy for that is what I would call co-living. Okay. So it's like the opposite of. Yeah, I'm familiar. Yeah, co-living is amazing. Because yep. if you if you look at how many renting households are there in, in the United States, there's 47 million renting households in the United States. 17 million of those 47 million make less than $32,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So when we're going through what we're going through right now, where inflation is still at 5% or whatever it is, and they just raised interest rates and people are losing their jobs left and right. I'm in the TV world and our TV... Uh, production companies, like just so you know, advertisers have cut all advertising cost on all TV across all platforms. Yeah, a lot of YouTubers are feeling it. Like, oh yeah, they, like and same with me. Like I, I see like what p advertisers paying for uh, slots eighteen months ago compared to today. Yeah, I was making our YouTube channel made like back in uh, five months ago is like twenty two, twenty three thousand yeah. dollars. This month we made fourteen thousand yep. with more views. Mm -hmm. So okay, if that's the case and I have defaults and I have renters defaulting, I wanna be insulated. So what I wanna do is I actually wanna to cater to the affordability. So what you do is you take these three bed, two bath houses. This is a, fo a focus of mine over the next two years is that um, I'm focusing on affordable rents mm -hmm. below, well below the median rent rent rate. So it's called, the, the name of the company I'm using is a company called padsplit.com, okay? So PadSplit is a co-living company. They find tenants for you. They manage the property for you. They collect the rents. They deal with all the stuff. And what it is, is they go to your three bed, two bath house. Let's say Dominic has a three bed, two bath house. And they go, hey, this living room and this dining room need to be converted to bedrooms. And that garage needs to be converted to another bedroom. They typically get like about seven people per house co-living in a three bed, two bath house. And it not only doubles your cash flow, but it also insulates you from Defaults. All defaults. Yep. Because let's say even if one of the people in the house defaults. Even if two of them. Three even of them, two, three. Matter. If you have You're eight good. people in the house, right. Right. Yeah, we were looking at uh, building um, co-living in Culver City. So smart. Years ago. And like micro units are popping up everywhere. Right. Um, which is like a 300. What, st what stopped you? Uh, we just ended up not doing it, moving to Florida. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think co-living, because if you're renting by the week. Okay, this is an interesting statistic. 17 million people are making like under $32,000 a year in, in America. Yeah. Holy smokes, bro. Like how does anybody afford rent and groceries? I mean, groceries have doubled. Gas is crazy high. Mm -hmm. All these things are going up and up and up and up and up. How does the everyday American afford this? Well, this is where I'm focusing a lot more on mobile home parks. Yeah. 
I'm focusing on a lot more affordable apartment complexes. And then more importantly, I'm going after like eight to 24 unit small multifamily that I'm turning into co-living. So I'm like I'll take a two bed, two bath apartment yep. and I'll turn it into a four bed or maybe a five bed co-living apartment. And now I've got an apartment complex with, you know, instead of me having 24 tenants, I now have 124 tenants. Right. And there, I'm insulated. The tenants now, we've solved their affordability thing. Here's what's interesting. Average ten, average um, renter pays $1,800 a month in rent. In a co-living environment, their average is $750 per month. And they have their utilities, their internet, and the other things included. Yep. So now you've solved the affordability issue and you're insulated. So when the market is trending downward, guess where everybody flocks to? They flock to me. And yeah, they have no other choice. They have no other choice. And meanwhile... You got people out there talking about, hey, I'll teach you how to get into Airbnb. Guys, get the freak out of Airbnb. Like Airbnb is a good model as long as you're in like a high, um, a really great vacationing area. But people, it's sexy and it's fun to look at all the beautiful photos of the furniture. And it's, it's more of like you get people go, I oh, man, I want to design an Airbnb. Guys, this is about making money and providing a valuable service to people who need it. When the economy trends downward, you already know what's going to happen. What happens to Airbnb? Well, it's, I think a couple of things actually could happen. So um, over from 2020 to 2022, 40% mm -hmm. of all mortgages in America were taken out, which is a pretty big number. Yeah. Uh, the average down payment for a first time home buyer is 6%. And the average down payment for a second home is 13%. So people have on average like 10% equity. Yeah. Um, cost of sale, 7 or 8%, 5% to agent. Um, then maybe two points for closing costs and you right. know, escrow, whatever. And so most people don't have any equity. And nope. so when people are looking at an option, they can't sell it. They'd have to turn it back to the bank. So or, to or, ha or hand the keys over to Dominic in my Facebook group on a sub two deal. So what, like people are going to have to get creative. Yeah. So they're either going to try to do something like what you're doing, um, either lease it out and try to just hope that the tenant actually pays rent, or maybe do Airbnb and do short term rentals to try to like pull in some more yield. Yeah. Um, but I think that people are going to, over the next couple of years, get as creative as possible to try to hold on. I think, actually, that's a really great thing that you just highlighted to me. Because I'm thinking, like, I think the homeowners need to be educated of, like, what can you do as a homeowner in this environment? Because agents are not going to teach them that. No. No offense to, to you real estate agents out there. If you're watching John Williams' podcast and YouTube channel, you're not a regular real estate agent. You're actually trying to learn the investment side. But I, my experience is 95% of agents don't actually make a full-time in, income from being an agent, mm -hmm. and they don't know how to educate their client. They just know how to go, all right, well, you want to sell your house? Great. Let me have somebody else comp it and tell me what it should sell for. Yeah. Or they ask the seller, what do you want to sell for? And they put a stick in the yard. But what sellers are going to need is really, really good education. What's interesting is that the number one lead source for my direct-to-seller acquisition team right now is expired listings. Yep. Okay, so in Maricopa County, where I'm at, 987 expired listings just in the last two weeks. What does that tell you? That tells you 987 agents got fired by the seller because they couldn't sell the house for a six-month time frame. Yeah. Holy crap. Okay, that's happening everywhere in the country. Yeah. So that means the agent didn't go to the seller and say, hey, you're asking too much money, maybe. Or maybe, maybe if you're not asking too much money, we're just trying to get you out of your mortgage. You can't get out of your mortgage without cutting a check. Are you prepared to write a check for ten dollars to $20,000 to get this property offloaded? If the seller heard that up front, the seller would say no. So I was an agent for years. And so, and I've had plenty of listings that I've lost. Right. Um, they probably listed, I don't know, 300 something properties, right. mainly the LA, like Beverly you, Hills meaning area. Meaning you lost them because the seller didn't sign with you in, originally? No, like I listed it. You listed it, couldn't sell it. Well, so I, I probably listed 300, 350 properties in total. Yeah. I've lost maybe like a fraction of those. Right. Um, but having that conversation to educate a seller, um, it's if they're ready, willing, and able, and they actually want to sell the property, it's a much easier conversation because right. they're willing to be open-minded as they to some like sort where of they motivation. need to go right. to be able to get the deal done. But a lot of people, especially in this environment, sellers, I would imagine, think that it's 2021. Yes. And so they're like listing their properties. <laughs> yes. Like, oh, yeah, you know, interest rates are three and a quarter, right? Or they see, they see stuff that's like people are like, well, the market is still hot because there's no inventory. 
there's a lot of different reasons why there's a, a, a slow a slow down of in, inventories. People are like, I, I'm, even if I want to sell, I don't want to sell. Like Eric right now, he's like, oh, I'd like to do a refi. Let's say hypothetically he wants to do a refinance. Dude, this dude's got a $1,200 payment on a $500,000 house. Yeah. He's not going to do anything. Nothing. Like he's going to stay where he's at. So um, that's a really great point. Sellers are somewhat belligerent in the sense of like they're not educated. And but so also they, there's like a big in, so there's 1.6 million agents. Yeah. In 2009, there was one point almost 1.1 million. Crazy. And so like think of it, you have a half a million influx of agents. Yeah. That are so used to easy money. Yep. That they've never had to have these hard conversations and really educate a seller because they're used to just listing it and getting 10% over asking. Right. Um. And so I think that what we're going to be stepping into is that paradigm shift where we're going to start seeing a hell of a lot more expired listings this and is, a lot of agents go out of the business. So this is what, yes, 100%. So I just started doing a monthly um, class in my office. So we bring in like two, 300 agents. And all I do is I bring in my closing attorney and I bring in um, a guy, one of the guys that helped write the Dodd-Frank Act once a month. Yeah. And we go through and we go, we're going to teach you how to do seller finance subject to novation agreements, wraps. We're going to teach you lease options. We're going to teach you all the things you need to know because if you don't know how to educate your seller on being okay with letting a, a, a new buyer take over their payments, you might not have all the tools you need to get the seller's home sold. And we're seeing a ton of success. Those deals are magically coming back to us, which is nice because the agents are going out and they're like, well, where do we find these people? I go, well, first off, your own listings. Mm -hmm. Second off, just called expired listings and say, hey, I'm an agent as well, but I don't want to list your house. I actually have a buyer that's willing to take over your payments if you would allow me to represent you. And the um, we're getting, that's where I'm getting most of my deals right now. So how will the, so let's say for example, on that, like it's a $350,000 loan, property's worth three fifty. dollars yep. um, And so like what investor would want to come in and say, I'm going to pay that agent uh, 14 grand, a 3%. I won't right? pay, I won't pay the agent for, I won't pay the agent 3% on a deal like that. I'll pay the agent typically one and a half percent. Okay. And then I don't have an agent on my side. Got it. So you pay them yeah. 7,500 bucks. Mm -hmm. Um, and then basically you would just take over the. Yeah. And I do all the paperwork. They don't know how to do it. Yep. Right. So I, I have my transaction coordinator step in, we do all the whole thing. So the agent, all the agent's doing is basically finding the lead, getting the seller to say yes. And I take over everything else. Interesting. Yeah. So I'll get 7,500 bucks for, for doing that. So how do you think that this whole landscape is going to change with what's happening with commercial real estate and a lot of like this work from home flow? Is there going to be certain areas that are going to offer more opportunity? Is there going to be certain, like, what do you think these changes are going to look like? You know, the multifamily, I, I talk to Grant Cardone about this frequently because he's way more into the multifamily stuff than I am. And he, what he's seeing is he's seeing the defaults are going to be coming down the pipe in the, in the multifamily commercial space, meaning the, all the syndicators, right, from three, five years ago were raising tons of money and they were overpaying on assets thinking yeah. that the market was just going to continue to go up. And rents were going to climb 15, 20% a year. Right. Greed, baby. Greed. It's crazy. So, um, you know, and I'm a victim of that as well, of, of, you know, my own somewhat greed where you get blinded by, you get a deal, you get a deal, you build confidence, you build confidence, you see the team cranking, cranking, cranking. And you're like, oh, third gear, we're going pretty fast. Let's go to fourth gear. Let's yep. go to fifth gear. Let's go to sixth gear. Um, so not criticizing them, but I'm just pointing out the, the, the facts. And now what's happening is the loans that they secured these properties with three years ago, five years ago, are now all maturing, meaning the banks are saying, hey, guys, these are due. You owe us all the money for these loans. And the people who syndicated raised all the money from their friends, family, and whatever, are saying, holy crap, these properties, the insurance went up. We had an adjustable rate mortgage. We're not cash flowing anymore. And they're hemorrhaging money. I'm seeing some people right now, some syndicators are called, they're calling me and going, can you help me raise money? I go, for what? What do you got? You got a project coming up? They go, I actually have to raise 5 million to keep the asset I bought three years ago. Yeah. 5 million. Mm -hmm. I'm like, let it go, dude. Yep. It's not going to get better. Yeah. It's going to get worse. Yeah. You heard about what happened in uh, San Francisco? No. A $300 million property on California Street. It was like 350,000, 340,000 square feet. Sold for 300 million four years ago. Uh -huh. And uh, now it, I think it's about to trade for 60 mil. 75% vacant. So you have like interest rates go up 500 basis points, 75% Ooh, vacancy. Bro. It is, it's interesting though, John, because I'm, I, I'm around the country all the time. Right? Yeah. Like, Dude, I see you like every, every, 
if I ever glance at your story, you're like a different place every other day. Yeah, like this last, I haven't seen my kids for a week, which is the longest I've ever been. But we just did our, a book tour, which is somewhat a big deal in our world. And so I went coast to coast. We went Seattle, LA, Phoenix, uh, uh, Vegas, Salt Lake, Denver, Dallas, Houston, Charlotte, Atlanta, Miami, Des Moines, and then St. Louis, all within like 10 days. And I drive around and I'm seeing freaking apartment buildings being thrown up. I'm seeing uh, like industrial space, like warehouses being thrown up. And then I also look at the paper and I'm looking at all these brokers coming to us and saying, all of our people are defaulting on these loans. I don't know what the freak is going on. Yeah, I'm not smart enough to know. All I know is I'm like, even Grant, Grant told me yesterday, he's like, I have $150 million sitting in a bank right now and I wanna deploy it and go buy more deals but I don't know what the crap is going on right now. Mm -hmm. I know people are in the process of defaulting and yeah. I know these things are going on right now. I think it's the very beginning of bad things happening and the compound effect has not hit here, there yet. And like what you talked about earlier with sellers being convinced that it's still 2021, I think people are hoping this doesn't happen and they're shutting their eyes and walking forward with faith. Yep. And I think that by the end of the year, we're going to know what the hell is going to happen. Yeah. Like there's some very interesting things going on and it's like, it's hard to ignore. And if we were looking at an economy that operated on true fundamentals, like we mentioned before we started filming today, yeah, like I feel like we would have seen uh, more of a recession the last couple of years. Like right. we would have seen some real pain. Well, the problem, what do you think the problem is? Is it the government pumping money in? I think that the problem is that they're not letting the economy act as an economy. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is basically they're printing money. They, were, they kept bills optional, rent optional, student loans optional. Um, so people couldn't really get a gauge on what was really going on. And they're going to continue printing money and yeah. continuing devaluing the currency. At least the, that's what it seems the like. The only people that win in that situation are the are the winners, the, well, money, the money makers, the, the money makers, the you, the yep. me, the people who own real estate, go print the money. Yep. When they, Every time they print money, I'm like, good, my, my, my real estate goes up, inflation goes up. I'm, I'm, I'm 100% hedged against inflation. Yeah. I'm not worried about it. But I, you look at what is going to happen to our nation for the people that are making $32,000 a year. Yeah. Like my, so I just hired a new personal assistant. Her name is May. Master's degree in child development. Okay. School teacher for all, kids with autism. Yeah. She also manages two para teachers, like two helpers in her class. Like she's a manager. Her salary is 35 grand a year. Mm -hmm. How the crap does somebody with a master's degree in child development make $35,000 a year? Like how is it that, our inflation is going up, but people are not getting paid more money. So what is that? What happens is I think as an investor, the only thing I can do, because I'm not smart enough, I'm not as smart as Grant Cardone. All I know is if I can go focus on affordability and say, that's where I'm going to make sure that I make my money is providing housing for people where like, again, average rent rate, 1800. If I can find a place for somebody to rent for me at 750 a month and hedge through like a co-living environment, I think in the next 36 months, 30% of my portfolio will be co-living. Yeah. I want to go that direction. And you've seen it, obviously, for the last couple of years, you almost did that project in Culver. Yeah. Are you wanting to do more of that stuff here in Florida? Uh, I'm looking at Florida, like where we are right now. It's a, like, prices are at record highs. Mm -hmm. Interest rates, the cost of our money is yeah. at very high. Like, yeah, unless but what I if, start what to see I, some, like, really, really big opportunities. What if, like, I, what if I brought you an 8-plex at 3% seller finance? All of that goes out the window, right? Yeah. Well, if it was a value add and it, it made sense, yeah, I would definitely do that. Okay. Is your thought process for your personal portfolio, your thought process is like, okay, let's say it's a half a million dollar value. Let's say ARV is 500000 You, John, want to buy at like three fifty, so you can add value to it? Or are you okay buying for five hundred if it's worth five hundred? If if it's currently worth five hundred and there's some maybe I could put a hundred into it and yeah. it'll be worth seven fifty or eight hundred, okay. I would do that all day long. You see, this is what's beautiful about real estate. You and I have a different strategy. Grant and I have a different strategy. Everybody has a different strategy. I don't care what the value of the property is. I care what I can do with it right away. So the money I put into it, I'm basically buying a debt. People go, Oh, you buy houses for a living. In the back of my mind, I'm like, No, I'm buying interest rates. Yeah. I'm acquiring other people's interest rates is more value to, valuable to me than the actual real estate itself. And then the second thing I'm buying is cash flow. So if I put in, like, I've, here's a good example of a deal I'm doing right now, co-living. 
So Las Vegas, 12 plex. Okay. Landlord mismanaging the property lives in like Dayton, Ohio. He's not managing the project. He's attracted. He has a lot of section eight tenants. Yeah. I, I used to have a lot of section eight tenants. I actually went away from, I don't want to have any government sponsored, any programs in anything I'm doing. Yeah. Cause then the government dictates how you evict, how you handle these people. And you're afraid of the government. Yeah, You're basically a manager for the government, right? Manager for the government. That's exactly what it is. Government's like, we can't handle these people here. We'll, we'll give you a portion of your guaranteed rent. So it's section eight. These What's happening is half of it's section eight, half of it's not. The half that's not are not paying their rent because they're upset with how the property has been managed. So they're like, dude, this is this is a squalor. It's mm -hmm. crap. So he's struggling and he's got a three and a half percent interest rate on this nine hundred thousand dollar asset. And I call we call him up. I go, just let me take over the payments. He's like, You would do that? I go, Yeah, I'll take over the payments. So I'll take over the payments and we'll evict everybody. We'll go in, put a hundred grand in, probably eight to ten thousand dollars per unit. Just refresh, you know, new countertops, new toilet, new sink, new maybe laminate floor, whatever. And then what I'm going to do is turn into co-living, and I'll triple the rents on a little twelve plex, and I will have a three point five percent interest rate. I will give the seller twenty five grand. He said I, originally it was like just take it off my hands. I'm stressed out. Now he's like I want twenty five grand. So we'll give him twenty five grand closing costs, and then I'll probably put a hundred to one hundred fifty grand into it but my cash on cash return is close to 30%. Like I'll net 30 grand a year off that 12 plex because of a co-living space. Yeah. I care more about if I deploy a hundred grand, how, am I, how much am I getting back at the end of the year as a cash on cash return than I care about the value of the asset itself. So I mentioned um, I had uh, Jorge Contreras on. Yeah, he's Everybody great. Guy? Yeah, great guy. Um, but he mentioned on the pod that he had a deal. Most of his deals always go well, but he had one specific deal mm. in like Joshua Tree that didn't go well, yeah. where they thought it was gonna make four or five grand a month. Was it an Airbnb? It was an Airbnb. Yeah. Like, have you ever had a situation where you basically took over a subject yeah. to, and then you thought it was gonna cash flow 1800 bucks a month? Lots. And then boom, it's vacant. You can't find a good renter. Worse. I ha I've had a lot of this happen. City of Atlanta. Yeah. I had 15 Airbnbs. City of Atlanta came out with Airbnb restrictions a year and a half ago. Just destroyed my Airbnb model. Well, what Gone, about long term? Um, long term no, model. No, I, the the worst thing I've ever had with a long term tenant is we had a. I'd say out of let's say a hundred, let's say hypothetically a hundred traditional rentals. Yeah. We probably have three or four of those a year that have significant issues. That's not bad. It's not bad at all. Yeah. But I've had issues where like a tenant will clog a toilet with um, Saran wrap. Like this girl. Um, wrapped her, the toilet with saran wrap so she could play a joke on her boyfriend when he came home. Yeah. So he pissed all over the saran wrap. And luckily she put this on TikTok so we were able to screen grab all this stuff, which is awesome. Um, and then she, when he did the thing, they were laughing, she took the saran wrap and shoved it down the toilet thinking it would actually flush. It flooded the whole entire, it's a two-story condo that we owned, flooded the whole thing and then she sued us for water damage and like I'm suing you guys because now I have respiratory issues. Yeah, yeah. We won the case, but you know we went to court for it, and it was a whole six month process. Um, we ju actually we just did a deal. I bought a deal, a cash deal. I rarely buy cash deals, but I bought a cash deal, Phoenix, Arizona, Monroe Street. The seller of the property says, "I want to sell the house to you, but you have to evict the tenant." And we didn't do enough due diligence on the tenant, bro. The tenant had been living there for forty three years without paying rent. 43 years. Yeah. Okay. It was a family member of the seller. And so the seller is just like, I can't do this anymore. I just want to be cashed out. I don't want to deal with this. I can't believe I dealt with it for 43 years. And um, so we go and knock on the lady's door. Her name's Mercedes. And I go, hey, I own the property now. Here's the deed. I'm just going to let you know you're going to be getting a letter from my attorney, or I can give you 2,500 bucks to leave right now. Yeah. And I did this on the TV show on A&E. And A&E ended up not airing it, but it was such a great clip. She says, how can you evict me from my house? Yeah, welcome to Los Angeles. Well, yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it, this is in Phoenix, which we have, we have favorable landlord laws. Yeah. But she says, um, she called it adverse possession. No, no, no. What was the word? Um, my attorney used it. She sued us and said she owned the property because she'd lived there so long. And she didn't, there was no agreement. She just, she's like, this is my lifestyle. Like I'm basically not just a squatter. Like I own the property. And she had a valid argument, turns out. 
It was a nine month process. Okay. I bought that property for 200. Okay. And I was going to t fix and flip it on the TV show. Cause we do fix and flips for the TV yeah. show, which is not my main business model. It's like 1% of what I do. But, um, you know, people on TV understand buy a house, fix it, flip it. Yeah. So we do, we do it on TV. So I buy the house at 200 thinking, all right, well, I'll put, probably put like 60, 70 into it and I'll sell it for like 380 after cost of selling. I'll probably walk away with like 45, 60 grand, somewhere between there. Okay. Well, that was freaking January of 2022 before interest rates went up. Yeah. So I got a hard money loan on the deal, 12% um, hard money. Okay. Now I've got a monthly payment on this. We're going through a lawsuit. And as I'm going through the lawsuit with Mercedes, interest rates go up. Home values go down. Okay. I end up spending between hard money costs, renovation, legal fees. I'm 150 grand into this house. So now I'm 200 plus all of that. I'm into it 350. I can no longer sell it for 380 to 400. I could sell it maybe for like 280. So now I'm 100 grand upside down in this deal. Happens. All the time. So what do I do? Lease it out. There you go. It's a three bed, two bath house. And I'm looking at it. And so I refinance out of my hard money loan. I, re, I got a good chunk of my cash that I put into it back out, but now I'm in an 8% 30 year am, or thir, not am, a 30 year um, fixed. It's 8% though. So now it's impossible for me to cash flow unless I go to co living. So now what we're doing right now is we're taking the carport and we're adding two bedrooms and a bathroom. And now I'll break even on that deal after a, acceler, after a higher cash flow. And I'll basically sit there for probably five years until I recover. Yeah. That stuff happens. Yeah. All yeah, the it time. happens. Yeah, yeah. All the time. And I, the cool thing is we tell those stories on our YouTube channel. I'm like, you, we're going to tell you the good, bad, and the ugly. Like, it's just like being a business owner. You're going to have to fire some employees. You're going to have some workman's comp lawsuits. You're going to have somebody upset with you. And if you don't like those things, then you probably shouldn't get into a business. Yeah. You know? So what, uh, what markets do you like the most right now? Um, I love Phoenix because it's my backyard. Favorable landlord laws for the most part. I love Texas for the landlord laws, but they're freaking taxes and insurance, bro. It's just like you guys here yep. in Florida. You guys are getting beat up. Mm -hmm. um, North Carolina, if I could focus all my efforts on one or two markets, I would go North Carolina, South Carolina, probably Atlanta. I really love Atlanta. Um, and Phoenix, those are my four main mar markets. What are like the median rents in North Carolina, South Carolina? What is that like? 1300 bucks, bucks in North bedrooms. Carolina. 1600 bucks is the median rent, yeah. It, the th here's what's funny about North Carolina. North Carolina has both the safest city in America and the most dangerous city in America. Okay? So there's a dichotomy in in North Carolina where it's like the main towns, Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, uh, Fayetteville where the ba there's a base there, Winston Salem. Those are great markets where the average rent is like 2000 bucks. Yeah. Okay, you go to other towns, it's like Whiteville. North Carolina, the average rent is like 900 bucks and it's a declining market of 5% migration every single year. People are leaving. So D North Carolina is just a funky city or funky state, but overall there's a lot of growth, tons of opportunity, temperate, mar uh, temperate, um, like temperate climate and, um, tons and tons, tons of tech companies are all, all moving in there. And you see North, you see everybody from the Northeast moving down. You see people from even California making it over to North Carolina. So it's, it's I, I think North Carolina um, was like top three places that everybody migrated to during the COVID world. Are there any like locations you kind of stay away from? Yeah, I, I don't like California. I hate California. I love the state just like you used to. Yeah. And it's amazing to watch how they're just destroying it from the inside out. And I don't see the end goal. Like I don't know what the goal is there. Is it just power? Is it Gavin? Is it these guys like, I just want to control people and I get I get off on it? I don't know, but it scares the piss out of me. Yeah. And so uh, California, Oregon, Washington, I don't want to be in, I don't want to be in Chicago, Illinois. I have mm -hmm. 265 units in, in Springville, Illinois, which is different landlord laws in a different county. And then I don't want to be in New York or New Jersey. Landlord laws. Yep. Denver is going to be the same, the next one. Denver is going to be the next city that, Right now, there's um, massive groups coming in and lobbying against landlords having yeah, I control. Heard about that. Bro, it's a big deal. Yeah, like a big deal. The, the one of the lobbyists came to my book signing and came and shook my hand, and he comes up, up to me in the book signing. I don't know if I ever I told this to Eric, but he came up to me, and he goes, 
um, do you know who I am? I go, no. Or you have a YouTube channel? Because, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, those are people I admire. And he says, no, I'm, I'm, in, um, I'm part of the group that's lobbying for blah, 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 blah. I would advise you to stay out of our, our, stay out of our town. Okay, thank you for coming to the book yeah. signing. Do you have anything you'd like me to sign? Yeah. Want to buy a copy for your wife? He, yeah, he, uh, he waited in line for two hours to tell me that. Like, they're hell-bent on changing the landlord laws there. Yeah. What a lot of people don't realize is, like, it doesn't happen overnight. They'll do the first step, and then before you know it, you blink, they're on the third step. Right. And then it just, like, continues to get, like, Do you think they're going to do that in Florida? They're talking about uh, rent control and rent regulation and a housing crisis. Do and you think for the whole city or the whole state or just, like, Miami area? No, I'm not going to say that they're going to do it the whole state, but what I would bet is that they it kind of, like, trickles in certain little pockets, and mm -hmm. then over time, other pockets can, like, start to um, adapt to it. Because as we have, a, like you mentioned, the average income is, like, what, 32 grand a year? If you have a pool of 99 out of 100 people that have incomes below 150,000, you're going to start to see a lot of people fighting yeah. against the landlord. So I'm not, I, I would think that Florida and maybe a handful of locations, like you mentioned, are going to do better over the long term. Um, but I feel like that is kind of like the direction that they're pushing America to go into. You know, it's interesting. I, I really wish, and this will never happen, but I really wish our government would spend more time and energy educating people on how to actually make money mm -hmm. instead of being a victim to whatever their environment is. I Look, I, I learned how to be a blue collar guy. Yes, I grew up in a, a white household, heavily religious parents, I had a leg up. My parents are all about staying together, community, da, 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 da. Big family, lots of resources. So I'm, I like was born on third base. Meanwhile, other people are still in the dugout waiting for an opportunity. I feel like, like, and like, uh, I feel like everyone born in America is born on third base. Yeah. Like if you have access to the internet, you have access, Boom. you can choose the people that you want around you. You Boom. can get access to the information you want. doesn't matter, like any, whatever the mainstream media says, if you're a privileged or not privileged, you, you, I feel like you you're pretty here and you see what you want to see. That's a good point. And the, the algorithm is pretty strong too. It's like the algorithm for TikTok and Instagram and even YouTube is so strong that whatever you're interested in, it's just going to feed you more of that. Yep. So if you're like, how do I make money? Guess what? All of a sudden, John Williams is going to pop up on your, on your feed, right? Like Pace Morby is going to pop up on your feed. You're yep. going to get fed the information not from the government, but from the algorithm going, we want to give you what you're asking for. And so if you truly want to do something and you want to get out of that $32,000 a year space and learn how to actually make money and, and improve yourself, then you can and the opportunity is there. But I do wish the government would spend more time and energy saying, hey guys, like the, the problem is not necessarily that landlords want to make money. The problem is you guys are not trying to improve your, your station in life. Yeah, You're saying, no, we should make $32,000 a year and you should cater to us. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, when the overwhelming majority of people are are in that arena, they end up winning the argument. Yeah. Like, so, you know, Dana White, UFC guy, yeah, yeah. Um, CEO of uh, UFC, he came out and said, the last thing that anybody wants is to be, uh, have their hand out to the government. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the last thing anybody wants is the, where the government basically has that final say. And with today, like people can basically rise up from almost anything. Right. Anywhere. And, position themselves to have a say. Yeah. I agree with that. I, I agree with that. It's interesting though, because I see tenants that I have that are like, you know, I don't deal with them. I have a, we, we switched away from a company called on Q property management, went to a nationwide company called mind property management. So shout out to mind. If anybody, um, I, I don't make any money off of that, Yeah, but mind is nationwide. So if you're like, who, who manages your property? Mind does my ma property management. And then I have a traveling asset manager named Heidi that travels all over the country and she homeschools our kids and travels all over the, the country. But um, out of all our tenants, I'd say most people are like, I'm grateful for this affordable rent. But then you get a good portion that are like, how dare you charge me this much money? And then the, uh, mind property management, somehow, some way, some of these complaints come fi finding themselves to me of like, this tenant is, says that they're going to damage the kitchen if we don't lower their rent. And so I'm like, how entitled are they? What the freak? Yeah. It's weird. There's there's entitled people in this country, people that are spoiled with all the things that are around them, and they grow to believe that they, they deserve it. So how do you think things will kind of uh, roll out of the next few years? Bro, I think that um, I look at what's happening in other countries. I think that I think that overall – our, our country is lo losing its power in the on the world stage. 
for sure. It is scary to think about. And I've got a couple of buddies that have just recently moved to Dubai and they're like, we're no longer going to be the superpower in 10 years. Yep. I'm going to start, they're going to, I'm going to start going and getting myself into other situations. That's, that's like world economy, right? They're, they're trying to go, Hey, we're going to get away from the dollar. That's a scary thing. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's go just in, internally to the United States. I think we're going to continue to trend towards a renter nation. I think that there is some sort of superpower at play, Blackstone and all these very high level, like unbelievable intelligent super computers that they have in their algorithm that they yeah. use. These guys are manipulating our economy to benefit their shareholders and to benefit themselves. And I think that their goal is to ultimately go, how do we just turn this entire nation into renters? Yeah. That's basically what they're doing. They just raised right. a thirty billion dollar fund. Crazy, like, and they're you know they're going after uh, single family rentals. Yep. I believe they're going to go after like that two hundred to four hundred thousand dollar price point mm -hmm. because people that are in the five hundred six hundred thousand dollar homes are going to go there. The renters are going to have no choice but to go there. Yep. And then they're going in um, hospitality. Yep. And uh, and data centers. It's crazy to to see, and and I think that we're we're trending to, towards renters nation, and I think that the rich are going to continue to get richer. The here here's the thing. You can try and tax us more. We have smarter people than the government. Mm -hmm. And we're going to figure out a, a loophole or a trust or a spendthrift trust yep. or this or that or whatever. We're going to figure out how to pay $0 in taxes. Yeah. It's the poor people that are really going. It's Actually, it's the middle class. Yeah. It's going well, the away, bro. It's like, yeah, it's like almost faded. It's fading away. And so that's a scary thing is the middle class is, is going away. The haves and the have-nots is really what America is going to go to. I don't know how long that's going to take, but it is scary to, to look at that is like middle America is going to basically be decimated over the next probably 15 to 20 years. And is it a plan or is this just the way that thing, things evolve naturally? I don't know. The thing that's scary for me is think about this. Dude, AI is bonkers. Yeah. You know, okay. It's stupid. Like what, how we're using it in our media company. We're using it in our real estate. We're doing certain things. AI will not replace your job. But the person who knows how to use AI will replace your job, yeah. okay? What, where does that leave us in 20 years? Like, think about what AI will be able to do in 20 years. 20, let alone five. Where does that put me as a real estate investor? Should I own any luxury homes? Should I own any single family homes? Or even are we, did you ever see the movie uh, Ready Player One? No, I haven't. Holy crap. It basically just talks about what's going to happen in the next 30 years. Like everybody's going to be plugged into, you know, meta mm -hmm. and they're going to be playing video games all day long and living a completely different alternate life. And they're going to be living in these little shanties that they're, you know, basically the government, they're government sponsored. I think scary. I think we might be uh, heading towards universal basic income. Oh, for sure. Um, like I, it's funny you say that. I bought these two Nokia flip phones, mm -hmm. one for myself, one for my wife. And I was going to basically leave my iPhone over there um, on my desk at the office, and I would just take the flip phone home. I wouldn't do any social media, nothing at home. Smart. But then when I went to go try to uh, switch and get a new phone number for that phone, they wouldn't. They would only work with uh, smartphones. So I had to get like a different phone. But I have a feeling that that is going to become much more common. Like that metaverse type of thing five years, ten years from now. Like right. when people are start to. Because all advertisers, business owners, they're going to start to integrate more and more and more towards that. Mm -hmm. um, and people are like addicted to their phones now more than ever. Yeah. And, you know, the cool thing about, you know, you and me is we recognize social media and YouTube as a way that we make money. Yeah. Right. I don't I don't make a living off of our we give our YouTube income away every month. Like we're not living on our YouTube income. We give it away. Like last month we gave it away to a, a, a single mom. Two kids, doesn't have a car, was borrowing a, a car every day to go to, to get to work. So we went and bought her a minivan, two years of insurance, two years of all this stuff, and we just give our YouTube income away. Um, and it's a lot of fun doing that. But I do make a lot of money from YouTube. The way I make money from YouTube is people bring me deals. Private money lenders come to me. I recruit amazing people. So, But I use that platform as a way to an end. Other mm -hmm. people use that platform as a way to entertain themselves as a, as a checkout device. I'm going right. to check out from reality, and I'm going to go and hang out and get my dopamine drip all day long. Bro, I, I'm not getting a dopamine drip from any of my social media. Yep. And Same. neither are you. Yeah. Like, if I post something, I'll post it, and then I'll scroll for, like, 30 seconds, and i put it down. Yeah, same here. I, what I actually do, probably same thing as you, is I look at the people I look up to. 
and I see what they're doing and I'm like, ooh, I like that. I'm going to put my own spin on that. Or, ooh, I didn't know that was going on. Oh, we should collaborate on that idea. That's the primary source I use social media for. Yeah. Like how, so how long, what do you think this transition is going to look like over the next, like, do you think it's going to be something that's going to be a slow drip over five or 10 years? Or do you think it's going to be I think it's, 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 it's going to be a slow drip. People don't know it's happening. It's kind of like groceries, right? It, it wasn't like your grocery bill was a hundred bucks and the next day it was 200 bucks. It was, it, that hundred to $300 thing took three, four years and it slowly ate people away and it's become a thing that people talk about more because inflation got so high, but adoption will be the biggest issue, right? Because AI, even though people are talking about it, there's a lot of people that haven't started adopting it yet. Mm -hmm. And so as cool as AI is going to be and as powerful as the technology will be, there are people that, bro, there's people that don't even know how to log into their freaking email inbox. Like they have to call GoDaddy and go, my email's not good. Well, did you restart your computer? Oh, I'll try that right now. Like there yeah. are th those types of people. So I think that what will happen is it will take much longer for the world to adopt it and for it to go into full blown, like the world has changed. And I think that's a 20 year time frame. Yeah. And it's not because the technology won't be there. It's because the majority of human beings will not have adopted it. Yeah. So like how, and I agree with a lot of that, like how I think things are likely going to go is I think that like we have the, like a five to seven year window yeah. of probably the best time ever to educate yourself and like learn as much as you can, start businesses, get around the right people, get the right information. Um, but if you do it, then you're able to use AI or able to use tech and implement a great team yeah. to help you scale that up and then use that money to either invest further into real estate or whatever you're going to do, but build out like a mode of safety around yourself and your family. Yeah. So like Dominic, for example, right? Like you've got three camera angles here, yeah. right? So normally what an editor would do is you would go in through, what do you use to edit? Okay. So you, dope. This is great. So Premiere now has something called Firefly. Are you using, is that what it's called, Eric? Firefly. You're not using Firefly yet, right? Oh my gosh, bro. So instead of you having to dice up and cut up all the things, you throw Adobe Firefly will just do all of the work for you. I think I saw that on uh, TikTok. We started using it, dude. It, it's it'll like you say throw three angles in it. It's like, it, it breaks it all down. And yes. It's like, every time I'm talking, it's on me. And every time you're talking, it's on. So here's what's happening. So our editors, we have four editors. We have, okay, we have five editors. I do, we do a YouTube video every day. So I'm crazy. Do you, how often do you do yours? Every day, Monday through Friday. you freaking amazing, dude. So our editors are like, this is going to replace us. It's like, no, it will make you better because now that whole waste, you're, you're such a smart person, but you're spending your whole day deciding which angle of the camera needs to be pointed on whatever yeah. during that, that clip. Let AI take that out and you can then spend the extra two hours going and creating a new idea or a new clip or a new, yep. you know, whatever. Or I don't even care if you don't do anything. I just care that the job was done. And so what we started implementing in our job or in our company is we said, every two weeks, we're going to give away $500 to the person who has, a, has utilized AI in a new unique fashion that the rest of the team can learn. I'm not planning on firing any, anybody, but their immediate gut reaction was, this is going to replace me. Therefore, I don't want to bring it into the world. Yep. And so the faster that Dominic, you start adopting it, the more powerful you become in his world. And then you can start going, wow, this is, we're making more money here. We're amplifying our results. Therefore you get paid more money. Then maybe at some point he's like, let's hire another person underneath you. Let's get a fourth camera angle. Let's get a this, let's get a that, whatever. AI will allow you to do all of those things. And um, the people that don't utilize them will get, they'll go, man, why, why is pace so far ahead of me? It's like, cause we actually implemented AI. Yeah, I definitely think that there's uh, so much opportunity. Like, and then what what do you think are a couple of great businesses right now that could adapt AI that would allow people to basically start for a little money mm -hmm. and maybe scale it up to get to a place to maybe make two, three grand a month, four the, grand a month. Okay, so I'm this is close to you and me, but people that are content creators need a Dominic. They need an Eric. And have you ever had a hard time finding an editor? Uh, I've been working with the same editor for like three years. He's, Holy he's crap. Yeah. You're, you got lucky. We've been through 40 editors that just don't want to work. 
Yeah, yeah. We've been dealing with that with other aspects of our team. Yeah. Like we had, uh, I don't know, a handful of people that would come on like really hot to get to work, and then two, three days later, they're ghost. Yeah. Boom. Sucks, dude. And you deal with this, right, Dominic? You deal with this a lot? So for us, we deal with that a lot. And I look at that, and I'm like, if I'm a young kid, let's say I'm 15, 16 years old, if I learn how to edit and start utilizing AI, I can make 10 grand a month right like really, yeah. really quickly working for other content creators and go, hey, I'll, I'll, I will speed up your processes. I will do this for you. Give me your footage, and I'll make sure that it's um, chopped up, cleaned up, edited, and put up there. So from like a baseline, how do I make money today, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, at least five grand a month, maybe up to 10 grand a month in your first year, go do that. Yeah, You don't have to get a college degree. Um, other businesses that are using AI, we're using AI in like 15 different aspects of our business. So let's say I, one of the companies I own is a company called startvirtual.com. And what we do is we do cold calling for real estate investors and when we have a new client coming to us and saying, hey, I want to on get onboarded and potentially um, think about hiring you guys to do all my cold calling, we send them a text message. We send them uh, an email to remind them of their booked call with us. Yeah. And we still have like a 40% no-show rate. We started using AI where it takes my voice and says their name. And it says, hey, Dominic. It's yeah. pace, bro. Talk so in 20 minutes. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm so excited about our call in 20 minutes. Can't wait to see you. Blah, blah, blah. And our no-show rate went from 40% down to like 11%. Right? So using AI to do the uh, do the non-scalable items can be used in every business. Like think about everybody right now, whether you have an existing business. If you have an existing business, implement it. If you don't have a business, you could start using the appointment setting, that little AI right there, and go to going to other business and go, could I take your no-show rate from 40% to 11% and you pay me a consulting fee of $7,000 a month? Yeah. Go get 10 of those clients. You got 70 grand a month. Yeah. Boom. There's so many ways to make money. Do you have a, so you said you had a son, you guys were doing like a sub two on like an Escalade, right? How old is your yeah. son? He's 15. So he's 15 years old. And so you're getting him into like, kind of like your world right now, right? Yeah. Is he doing like social media and he's like, kind of learning creative finance with you? Yeah, he, he so my son used to go on appointments with me when he was like eight, nine years old. And when I used to be the guy out in the field, I'm not, I haven't been on a physical appointment. I will go on physical appointments to buy houses Yeah, where I talk to sellers only if my students are like, hey, you're in town, I've got an appointment, will you go? And I'm like, yeah, for content reasons, I'll yeah, go. Yeah, for sure, yeah. But um, outside of that, I haven't been for a long time, but Asher started because I was a contractor and doing real estate simultaneously back nine years ago. So I'd pick, I'd be rushing through my day, pick up Asher from school and I go, Hey, we got to go on an appointment. Then I would sit in appointments with him and he would be quiet. Cause he's just a really calm, you know, even killed dude with a great demeanor. And he wouldn't say anything. We'd get out of the appointment and I would say, what did you notice about that seller? And I recognized he's so intuitive. He would go, Oh, She's going through a divorce, so she needs this. And then if, if this happens, then it would trigger this. And she, she would then need a place to live that blah, blah, blah. I'm like, holy crap, you said that as a nine-year-old yeah. kid. So he's a, he's a great observer. Very he's not forward-thinking. Very, very forward-thinking. So I'm thinking, my dad taught me how to go paint baseboards. Mm -hmm. And I became a freaking contractor. I'm going to get my kid involved in things that I know are, for longevity reasons, are not going away social media, YouTube, um, micro businesses. And so the first business I got him into was renting tr dump trailers on his own little website. Oh, cool. So, so basically like what for like uh, job sites, construction sites, they yep. go pick up drywall or concrete, whatever, throw yeah. it in there. And uh, so if you look up, so if you, if, if anybody's watching and want to go see this, Asher Foss is his name on YouTube. He's probably got a thousand subscribers. He's just starting out. He's got probably 15 videos on there. And the first video is us walking through his trailer that I bought on seller finance. So I found a seller, had a trailer in their front yard, knocked on the door. Hey, I want that trailer. Would you sell it to me on seller finance? And they go, no, I need that trailer. I go, okay, well, what if we um, rented it out for you and we gave you half the profit? We took the half the profit. So this, that was the first trailer we got. Yeah. And then after a while, the, the seller's like, I don't really need the trailer. Why don't you just make me some payments and you can just pay it off? 
So he has a trailer we bought on seller finance. He rents it out $125 a day for a full day, um, $100 a day for two days or more. And that little business makes him like $1,800 a month net. That's awesome. It's really good. And then he's got a little Turo flea. He's got a Kia that we bought subject to. He took over somebody else's payments. He's got my my original Prius that I used to go on appointments with the, with Debbie Lou, the, the private money yeah. lady. And right now I'm like, all right, now you've got some capital. Let's go and buy your first house. So I'm showing him how to set up an LLC properly. And what I'm forcing him to do, because I'm a traditional dude, I'm a married guy, want to be with one woman the rest of my life, want to just have an amazing family and hang out with my kids as much as I can. I want my son to learn how to take care of women. Yep. And so I've got two daughters. And so I go, Asher, your sisters need you to take care of them. And you are going to be their um, leader. So you're going to put an LLC together and all the real estate you acquire between now and you're, you're 18 is going to go in this LLC that you share with your sisters. And it gives him the abundance mindset of like, I'm going to go provide for other people that I'm ahead of. Yep. So that's what my main focus is right now. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, that there couldn't be a better gift for I your son, yeah. for your family. And it's fun. It's a better way to spend time because people are like, you, you know, I want to spend more time with my kids. Okay, great. So does everybody else. But what are you doing with them? Yeah. You know, well, we're hanging out. We're watching Netflix and doing whatever. Okay, I like that too. We're tr but I take my kids. We travel. We get in an Airstream. We'll go for like five, six months straight and just go all over the country. I want my kids to see cultures and other skin tones. Yep. I grew up in my high school. I had one black kid in the whole school. And then you go to Atlanta and it's like 70% African-American. Yeah. It was a shock to me. So I'm like, how do I get my kids to see every culture, see what other parts of the country look like, open up their eyes to the possibilities and how big this world really is and that they're not just in this little micro universe of a, a cul-de-sac. Yeah. You know? So what about you? What are you doing with your kids? Uh, so I have a three-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old. Oh, yeah. They, they can't even speak English yet. Well, no. They have a, we have a, <laughs> a full-time nanny that speaks only Spanish. Oh, genius. So the, the three-year-old's almost fluent. Maybe wow. like another five or six months he will be. And the other one can speak more Spanish than English. Wow. And my wife now is, uh, she's going to get a private pilot's license. She has her first day today. Oh, wow. So like they're basically, I just want them to learn as much as possible to put themselves in a place to kind of see the world differently. Yeah. And then I can't speak Spanish, um, but it would be great to be able to uh, see those two communicate with each other and potentially pick up other languages as they get a little bit older. But like investing in your family, I don't think there's a better way to spend money. No better way to spend money. And, you know, like my end goal, I have this vision is I want to have 2,000 acres in Montana. I want to have a, a gushing river going through my 2,000 acres. And I want to be able to spend six months a year there without having a cell phone on me. That's like the dream. That's the dream. Ha like just walk out on my back patio, have some horses, have a barn, be up against the mountain. And um, like we're looking at property in Kalispell, Montana this summer to go look at and start kind of manifesting that dream. And for me, it's like, I want to have a place where not just my kids can be, but my kids can bring their kids and, uh, you know, have our, a little ranch and just get away from what I think. Uh, it, one of my biggest fears too, is in Arizona, we have a water crisis, major water crisis. And we've, we're, we suck all of our water out from underground aquifers and they're all almost depleted. Hmm. The Colorado river, the rights, the water is going other places. It's a major issue. Like yeah, major, yeah, major hear, issue. I hear about it. And they're saying that we're going to have no water within 10 years. And so they're thinking like, we need to do desalination and pipe water in from San Diego. Like that's the, that's the conversation right now. Wow. So I'm thinking, I want to get away from that. I want to get, I want to go to towns that are still 20, 30 years behind in technology where you go down to a cafe that people are still hanging out and it's like the overweight, but super friendly Lady Sherry, yep. who knows everybody that comes in. And I, I want to be able to spend half a year in that environment with my kids and show them like, this is what life really is, not technology and being with your phones. Yeah. So my wife's family, they're from a, a little town in uh, Nebraska, mm. total population like 200. Yeah. And their family is like just very traditional old school. And when you go to a family reunion or any type of uh, dinner, no phones out, everyone's just like fully engaged eye to eye. And it's just like, it kind of takes you back 20 years. Yeah. And you feel wholesome and yep. clean and you're like, wow, this, I want more of this in my life. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, I, I think kids nowadays don't even recognize what that was. I, when I was, I, so I was, I lived in Arizona junior year, high school. 
my parents moved me to Utah senior the summer before my senior year, so I had no friends. And my next door neighbor be, ends up becoming one of my best friends. And he's like, hey, let's, you know, you're new in town. This is what everybody does. We go hang out at this gas station, Hearts. That's what kids used to do. Yep. They would go hang out at gas stations. They'd go out in the fields. We'd play night games. We'd play like sardines or we'd play whatever. And that's how I grew up. And I now look at that gas station. We go and visit that same city once a year. And there's like a parade we go to every year. The gas station got torn down. And guess what it is? It's a, it's a um, gaming center now where people can plug in and like put. Yeah. And I'm like, like lasers. And how whatever. freaking like, weird is this? Is that a gas station that everybody used to hang out at and just get around and talk and commune is now a place where people get into and plug into, you know, um, virtual reality. Yeah. So, so weird and ironic. Yeah. Well, pulling it back with the family doing mm -hmm. Montana, that would be, uh, are you going to do that through rentals? Is that kind of like, how do you see getting that? Right? Oh, I'm already, I'm already there. Like I financially am beyond the ability to do that. The pro here's, here's one of my biggest struggles in my life. It's not a struggle. It's something that I'm so grateful for the responsibility for this, but my responsibility is not just to me and my family. It's to my 600 employees and their families, right? Like think about um, all the businesses we have and all the people that rely on my decisions. Like me sitting with you today is a decision I made to take time and energy away from my wife and kids to come and give that time and energy to spend with you and collaborate and become friends with you. And that's a great decision. But I made that decision and it ultimately either benefits or hurts the people in my life, right? It's a tremendous pressure to have 600 families that get a paycheck every two weeks reliant on your decisions when you leave your door every day. Right. So the whole, I'm going to hang my hat up today just because I've financially made it is something that I look at and I go, did God or the universe put me on this earth only to take care of my wife and my kids? Or did they give me, did the universe or God give me a higher calling that I have to step up to and make sure that I continue to go forward until these other people are all taken care of as well? And so that's, that's something that's on my mind right now of like, how long do I go? How long do I go super hard? So this year, the number one goal I have is to take one day of week of work off my plate every week in 2023. 2024, one more day, 2025, one more day. And I'm going to go down to a three day work week. And the other days is just kids and travel and maybe the TV show. Cause it's fun. Cause I get to be with my wife and kids on the TV show. Yeah. And then I'll go to a three day work week and that's it for Sounds the rest like of my life. Three transition. Days. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm right now I'm addicted to what I do. Cause it's fun. Probably same thing with you. It's like, there's this constant pull of like family versus providing for my family. Right. And if you have a female in your life, right, you're nurturing motherly energy over here that's like, thank you so much for going and working, then you feel okay and just in going out and working hard. Right. But there's a lot of men out there that don't have that feeling. The women in their lives are like, why are you working so hard? So it depends on how my wife looks at every minute I work, I'm doing it in an act of servitude and love to my family. And so it's not a problem. For other people, it's like, how do you balance that? It's like, well, I don't because it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Every minute I'm working, I'm providing for my family. And every moment I'm providing for my family, my wife recognizes that with gratitude and it only makes this feel better. Definitely. So I'm lucky in that regard. And so it's like, why would I quit if I'm feeling that way? If I hate my job, some people hate their job. Doctors, lawyers, attorneys, you know, closing attorneys, all these people that I work with, they're like, I hate my job. I wish I just want to get out of it. I'm like, I don't have that feeling. I did when I was a contractor. I hated it. I hated yeah. dealing with clients. I hated doing all that stuff. Real estate has already afforded me the ability. We could do whatever we want. Like, I, not, I can't do what Grant Cardone does, go buy a $100 million house in Malibu. I can't do that. But I could go buy a $20 million spread in Montana and get debt on it and be able to afford the payments for the rest of my life. So, you know... I don't know, man. At the end of the day, I'm. I think I'm living a pretty good life already. Every yeah, day. Yeah, you're just blessed, man. You got a great family, great community. I removed. I removed the bad people from my life. That was one of the biggest things. Yeah, and I imagine it's probably the same thing with you. Did when you came out here to Florida, you feel like you met new people that amplified your ability to see the world a different way. I was pretty fortunate. So when I came out here, I had two really good friends. 
Uh, one we met when both of us, neither of us had money, like 12, 13 years ago. Such a great And um, we both ended up, life ended up working out well for both of us. Mm-hmm. And uh, he bought a place in Miami Beach. Amazing. And then uh, my other friend's an attorney. And he must he not be married. Right. No, he's not married. Yeah, you, ain't, li- you ain't living in Miami Beach if you're married. The other one that's, uh, he's an attorney, he is married. And, and he's so up here. He's in Delray. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he's not far. Um, But yeah, and then we just basically have a community of people that are kind of on that wavelength. Right. So like everyone in my life basically is like family people. Yeah, I love it. And if you've got that, you've got everything and other people just don't. And I would I would say like Dominic, you're as you start your life, the num- the number one piece of advice. And I hope you'd agree with me. The number one piece of advice, every th- every like all your outputs that you're looking for, like yeah. here's my output. Well, there's really you got to have an input plus an input equals an output. It's like 1 plus 1 equals 2, right? Okay, so if I know I want 2, how do I go get one and one? The number one thing I would say is you've got to get better quality people around you mm-hmm. is input number one. Input number two is remove the bad people from your life. And you it literally solves every problem I've ever had in my life is I don't know anything except for what I've learned from other people. Yeah. And so if I want to learn more, I want to make more money. All it comes down to is those two inputs. I input better people and I input the removal of bad people and I then have a higher quality life. It's no no time ever did I just sit down and go, all right, I'm going to read a book and it's going to change my life. It's It was always about the people that I surrounded myself with. Are you the same way? 100%. Like if I go, if I go hang out with somebody and they make me feel good and I'm learning something and I feel like, okay, they have, they see the world similarly. They have a great family. They're they want to do well with the people around them, I'm going to make an intent to spend more time with that person. Right. And you might even subconsciously be doing it because it's like the same thing with you and I. We're both family men. We both love real estate. It's like, okay, well, man, we're on the same wavelength. Why don't we spend more time together? I'll get really great ideas from you like I always have. You'll get great ideas from me because essentially what we're doing is we're crowdsourcing each other's experiences. So you're going out into the, the world all day long getting re- relationships, resources, and experiences, bringing them back to my relationship with you. And I'm doing the exact same thing. And we're just aggregating all these amazing high-level quality things. And we're sharing them between the two of us. Dude, it's it's the, it's the secret to life. Definitely. Well, Pace Morby. Bro, look up to you. Appreciate you so much. Thank you so much. Pleasure, man. It was great having you on. Thank you.